Right before we jump into this lens review, would you like me to send you a free guide to capturing motion in low light situations? If you said yes, just look for this orange box over on fronosphoto.com, put your name, email address in it, hit send it, I'm gonna send you that guide for free. Jared Poland, fronosphoto.com, and this is a review of the Canon RF 24 to 105 2.8 L USM Z lens. Now we'll talk about the Z in just a minute, and no, it doesn't mean that it's available for Nikon Z mount, but this is a first of a kind lens like this. A lens that goes from 24 to 105 and is a 2.8 all the way through. It's not a 24 to 105 F4. It's not a 24 to 70 2.8. It's a 24 to 105 2.8. It's one of those lenses that people have wanted throughout time. People want bigger zooms, larger zooms, with straight 2.8 apertures. Now, when you start going larger, that becomes much more of an issue. Now, I reviewed this lens from a photographer's standpoint because I took it to Kenya, but this is 100% going to be a fantastic video lens, and it really has a lot of features that lend it to being a great video lens. So right before I went to Kenya and went on a two-week safari, this lens showed up two days prior to me going, and I'm like, well, I am going on Safari, why don't I take it over there to test it out and review and just literally throw it to the wolves or the hyenas or the lions or the elephants or the cheetahs or all of the other animals I ended up photographing with this along with the people that were on the trip with me. So what are you gonna see in this review? We're gonna talk about everything from the photos that I captured to the outside of the lens, the inside of the lens, who it's for, what it is compared to some other Canon lenses, and of course, what it costs. So let's start with what does the Z stand for? It stands for powered zoom. That's right, there is an option to get what they call a PZ-E2 for $1,000 more. It screws into the side of the lens. There's some contacts on the PZ-E2, I'm assuming, that attach right here and then give you the power zooming capability and you can change the speed for that. Now, if that doesn't tell you that this lens has video in mind, I don't know what else does. Now, that isn't out just yet, so that's why I haven't used it, but when it does come out, we'll probably show you some Instagrams and reels and things along those lines so that you can see how it works. But from a standpoint of a lens, this feels fantastic in your hands. Now, in terms of size, if you have an older Canon 70 to 200 2.8 for the uh, EF mount, the version three, this is very similar in size, but not similar in weight. This is actually lighter than that lens is. So in terms of length, you've got 7.8 inches on this bad boy here, weighs in at 2.9 pounds or 1,340 grams, and is internal zooming, meaning as I zoom, Nothing is extending, like the 70 to 200 2.8 RF is not an internal zoom. That is an external zoom that as you turn the lens, the lens goes ahead and zooms out and zooms back in. That makes it more compact, which is actually smaller than this one. Now, in terms of the zoom ring, how is the throw? The throw is fantastic. The zoom ring is, in my opinion, in the right place. It never felt out of place like it does, say, with the 70 to 200 2.8 from Nikon. Do I like that the zoom is on the outside? The answer, Steven? No. No, where the zoom ring is all the way out at the end and makes it feel unstable. This is perfectly balanced right here. Move your thumb and forefinger and you can go all the way through the zoom range super quick. Now you do have your manual focus ring right here. And I will tell you, this feels so cinematic that it makes you think that was this just a cinema lens that they're like, it can do photos as well? The answer to that question is probably yes, because this has a very cinematic feel as well as a cinematic look to what Canon does with their cinema EOS style of lenses. You have a small lens hood here on the outside. You have your 82 millimeter filter thread, your 82 millimeter lens cap. You also have 11, yes, 11 aperture blades inside, not nine, not eight, you got 11. As always, you have your custom function buttons around the lens. You got here, here, here. Wait, let me see how many buttons there are. Nope, there's two. So it's not here, 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 and here. It's just here and here. When you're in vertical and when you're in horizontal, you always have one of those buttons within reach. You also have a tripod foot right here, which I personally take off. As soon as I get it, it 
leaves my camera? Is there a button on here that helps me take it off? How do I do this? Oh, there's a button. I gotta, there it is. Unscrew it, press the button, and you take it off. I basically throw this away, but if you're gonna be doing video, you're gonna wanna go ahead and leave this on. And for now, I'm just gonna go ahead and take it off. Now, there is an iris switch right here. This is something interesting and pretty new in a Canon lens. If we move this iris switch, we can go ahead and rotate the iris. So yeah, that's nice and smooth and is gonna be good for those people that are shooting video that want to control this. Now you can manually control it, of course, the same old way that we do when we're you know, changing the aperture on our cameras. But right now, if you were to put this on an R3 and try to change the aperture with this, it would not work. It's designed for future cameras that Canon will be coming out with, which we can only imagine what that might be, which will take advantage of that aperture ring. Continuing on with rings, of course you have your control ring out here, uh, like all of the RF lenses, or just about all of them have, so you can set that for whatever you would like to set it for, and we have the switches here on the side. You have your focus limiter, which no one uses at this point that I know of. I used it back in the day because lenses were so slow to focus. Now they're super fast to focus. You've got your manual to autofocus switch, you have your image stabilization on and off, and you have three different modes for image image stabilization, your one, your two, and three. One is set for panning, not number one, but I believe number three is for panning. Number two might be for not on stable ground, like if you're on a boat and you're moving, and one is the catch-all that I generally leave it on myself. You have your rotating ring right here for your tripod collar, but that really isn't necessary too much, but they basically threw everything and the kitchen sink at this lens, and it does feel fantastic in the hands. So now let's jump into some of the images, starting with this elephant. Now, if you're wondering, why am I at such a high angle? Well, I was in the back of the vehicle, the Safari uh, Land Cruiser, and you can't really get down low if you're in the back of the vehicle. You also can't really get out of the cars as well when you're in a uh, one of the parks. Now in a conservancy, it's a little different, but you also don't want to get out of the cars just in case you get attacked because what happens is the animals, they see the vehicle, this big vehicle, and they don't really see the people inside. They say that to us though a couple of cats did look at me a few times and I was like, can we, can we go now? So that's one of the things to keep in mind. Now, this isn't an extreme focusing type image, but you do have the dual nano USM motors inside of this lens. It focuses super fast. And in our tests here in the studio, we do realize that it's basically par focal, meaning as you zoom in, the autofocus stays the same. As you zoom back out, the autofocus basically stays right where it needs to be. So along with that and the fast focusing, I didn't miss anything with this lens attached to the Canon R3. Let me jump in here real quick because I wanna show you this photo taken with the 24 to 105 and edited with Fro Pack 4, starting with Blues Clues, followed by C41, we've got Copper Tone, DeLorean, High C, Kaleidoscope, Mel Brooks, Saltwater Taffy, Thick with three Cs, Tin Type, and Wet Hot American Summer. But my all time favorite from Fro Pack 1, Skittles. Boom. Look how good that looks. So look, if you wanna speed up your raw workflow, give yourself a great starting point, or you're just tired of other people's presets sucking, ours don't suck. We created 14 all new custom Lightroom presets that you can check out right now at fronosphoto.com slash fropack4. While you're over there, you can play with the sliders to see the befores and the afters. And if you decide to pick them up right now, they are currently on sale. Or if you wanna save even more and get the Grand Slam bundle, which includes Skittles from Fropack 1, you get Fropack 1, 2, 3, and 4, and you save even more. Now, let's get back to the video. Now, as we move on to the next elephant, I would have loved to have that low angle. One of the things you can do is put the camera on a monopod, stick it outside of the car, get it on a low angle, and use your phone to try and use the Canon Connect app, which I did for one of the pictures, not with this lens, but with an 85-1.2, and it worked out perfectly. Not easy to do, but you might notice some vignetting around the end of this, or the edge of this frame. Now, you do activate lens correction, or when you're looking through the camera, you are seeing 24 millimeters. That is the corrected frame that you're seeing. Now, when you bring it back into the computer, if you turn off lens correction, you will see the uncorrected image, of course, because you're turning it off. Now, you do notice a little bit of vignetting here around the frame. I tend to 
put a little bit more vignetting on. I like having some of that vignette draw you in to the frame. And with the lens correction on on this one, I, I tweaked it myself because I wanted it to draw me into the center of the frame. So that worked out pretty well. Now, speaking of lens correction, I know a bunch of people are a little confused how this is working today. Because when you attach, say, the 24 to uh, 105, or you attach the 10 to 20 to this, what the camera is seeing is a corrected 10 millimeter image. But when you bring it into the computer, if you do not have lens correction on in Lightroom, which is where I'm at, then you're going to see some bowing. But that is how these companies and manufacturers are designing lenses today. They're taking advantage of the digital uh, correction after the fact, which allows them to make these unique lenses that they couldn't make before. Case in point, you have the Sony 20 to 70 F4, which I was like, damn, this is a strong vignette. But that's because I had lens correction off in camera and lens correction off in the computer, it's meant to be on. So when you click that on, you are getting that 20 millimeter. What you are seeing, the corrected image is the 20 millimeter. At least that's what the manufacturers tell us. So I don't think they have any reason to hide that from us, but what you're seeing is the corrected image. So with this lens, as well as the 10 to 20, you are getting it corrected at 10 millimeters and you are getting it corrected at 24. You're seeing 24 millimeters and you're seeing 10 millimeters. So one of the other things that we photographed, we got up close and personal with a rhino named Baraka, who so happens to be blind and he's in a conservancy so that he doesn't get, you know, eaten out there in the wilderness. They were able to protect him, bring him in and use him for educational purposes. So I was able to get up close and personal. Now you do have a close focusing distance of 18 inches or 45 centimeters, and that's for the entire range. You could see I was up close personal here at 73 millimeters to the schnout of this rhino. And yeah, I got to pet the rhino, which is certainly nice. Now you could see I also focused on the eye of the rhino, even though he so happens to be blind. I believe this eye had a cataract and the other one he lost in the war. Um, I think he lost a battle somewhere and he lost one eye. And when they realized he was blind fully, they were able to bring him in. Now be sure to stick around to the end of this video. I'm going to run you a slideshow of more images that I can show you right here. So you can see some of my favorite images that I captured with the 24 to 105. Now when I'm out and about, I'm always a photojournalist at heart. There's other photographers on the trip with me, so I want to capture them in a photojournalistic manner. So here you can see Jason. This guy's name is Jason Hanna. He was along for the ride. He is the team photographer for the Kansas City Royals in Major League Baseball. And I just love having the versatility of 24 to 105. I did bring my 28 to 70 F2, but I didn't use it as often because I was testing out the 24 to 105. And at the end of this video, we're gonna try and decide which one of these two lenses might be the right one for you because they are going to be priced at the same thing. And they do two similar, but definitely different things. So I always want to capture photos of who's with me. So this one I bring up case in point is because this is what I saw in the viewfinder, right? This is the composition that I saw, but when the lens correction is off, part of the door from the vehicle showed up, but I never saw that when I was shooting because I did it with the lens correction that's built into the camera. So what I saw is exactly what I got when lens correction was on. Now in terms of portraits, you can absolutely get portraits with this lens. Now this photo was done at 70 millimeters and sure, if I had, well, I did have the 85 1.2, but not with me in the truck, I might have used that. But in a run and gun situation, the 24 to 105, you're not gonna see much of a difference. Yes, I'm gonna isolate the background a little bit more, but you can see that the background is totally dissipated. Uh, the next one of my buddy, Matt, I love the shot of him in black and white. You can convert these images and they're gonna look fantastic, but you can absolutely get portraits with a lens like this. So are there any imperfections that I found with the lens? Well, I was shooting in a strong sunlight as the sun was going down and you can see right here, photographing these giraffes, there are there is some lens flare going on. There there are a lot of coatings on this lens. It didn't really come into play anywhere else than when the sun was shining directly into the camera. This is what it looks like. I don't go out looking for issues and to test this stuff. This is just what happened in everyday usage. So if that is an issue for you, then take a look at it. But I don't think it's going to be an issue in the grand scheme of things. Now, what 24 millimeters looks like with a lion is this. 
Not a winning photo, but I'm just showing you what 24 looks like because this is what 105 looks like. Neither of those feel like the right lens for full on wildlife photography because you can't get fully up close and personal, though I did with the elephants because we were able to get a little closer at that time. So 24 to 105 is not going to be the best of the best for this situation, but in the photojournalistic situation, it's gonna be awesome. Let me jump in here real quick and let you know this video is brought to you by Squarespace. If you're looking to build your very own online portfolio, use what I've been using for almost 50 years now because it's simple, easy, affordable, and I don't need to know any coding. And when I put up all of my Safari photos, it was really simple to put them into a new gallery on Squarespace in a matter of minutes. To get your own 14 day free trial, head on over to squarespace.com slash photo. If you decide that it's for you, use the code photo at checkout to get 10% off your first order. Now, let's get back to the review. The last two images that I will show you is where the 24 millimeter absolutely shined. One of the things that people forget to do on uh, safaris or they think they need to do is just use long glass and they never capture the entire scene. And so I was happy to have the 24 to 105 to be able to get this cheetah as a major storm was blowing in and as the sun was basically at eye level of the cheetah, fully lighting it with beautiful studio lighting. And I was able to get this shot at 24 millimeters and I absolutely love it. The colors, the tones, the sharpness, everything about it, I personally love. So that is one of my favorite images that I captured along with this one that I call like Windows Vista. That's what I'll call it because there is actually a leopard laying there in the grass, but this tree looked awesome and the sky looked awesome and the clouds looked awesome and the colors pop off of this tremendously well. So don't forget to go wider when you can go wider, especially on a safari to get those beautiful landscapes. So how much does it cost? Well, this is a $3,000 lens, whereas the 24 to 70 2.8 is $2,399 and the 24 to 105 is $1,300. But like I said earlier, the 28 to 70 F2 is a $3,000 lens. Um, it's very difficult for me to tell you to go out and buy a 24 to 72 8 at this point, even though it is less expensive. I rather spend the extra 600 bucks personally to have a 24 to 105 and I'll deal with the larger size, but anybody that's shooting weddings or is a photojournalist is gonna love to have that extra reach when you need it over a 24 to 70. This is an incredible lens. So I think if you can afford it, a 24 to 105 is better in my opinion than a 24 to 70 2.8. And of course a 24 to 105 f4 is a totally different lens being that it's so inexpensive. But the 28 to 70 f2 is the reason I switched to Canon in the first place. Will a 24 to 105 replace that for me? And the answer is probably not. I love the versatility of 24 to 105, but I love what the F2 look gives me. So I'll probably have both of these lenses. Why? Because I'm special and Canon sends them to me and I get to keep them both on the shelf. If I had to choose between buying one or the other, for me personally, from a photojournalistic standpoint, 28 to 70 is where I'm gonna go just because I love the look of the F2, but I would not kick this out of bed. This would have been a tremendous concert lens way back in the day to be able to have that entire range, beautiful piece of glass any way you slice it. So the last two tests, you guys all know what's coming up. We've got the wind tunnel test and the sniff test. We're starting with the wind tunnel test. And, and by wind tunnel test, I mean sniff test. Thank you, Stephen, for correcting me. Ooh, elephant dung. That's right, it smells like the poop of an elephant. It doesn't, Canon, don't yell at me. It doesn't smell like dookie, okay? Fine, we'll do it. Oh, it smells like the dookie. It smells like Green Day. All right, wind tunnel test, here we go. Which I don't know if smells any better than dookie, honestly, elephants. But no, failed, failed, eh. failed the wind tunnel test. Cannot recommend you buy this lens if you need it to sustain in heavy winds. So what do you guys think about this lens? Which one of these four would you go with? Let me know down below. Thank you very much for watching. Now stay tuned for this slideshow because you're gonna see what I was able to capture with the 24 to 105. Jared, PolandFronosPhoto.com. See ya.